Hello, founders. Welcome, everyone. We are live for another episode of Startups.com Live. we got an amazing show planned out for you. Today, we have our guest advisor and fellow founder, Gwen. She is joining us. I'm always joined by Q and Jan, a part of our team. If you're in our audience or you're going to be watching this later on during the recording, thank you so much for joining us. Let's jump right into it and introduce our guest advisor, Gwen. Thank Hello. you for joining us. How are you doing? Fantastic. Thanks for having me, Ed. I appreciate it. You bet. You are on your way to recovering from a significant injury, just had surgery. You are yes. being a trooper by joining us. Thank you so much. Give us a little intro about who you are, what you do, and how you help founders. Sure. So my name is Gwen Mislinski. I'm the CEO and founder of Convergence Marketing. My main focus is to help founders with their content, with their messaging, make sure they're on the right path from the very get-go to make sure they know who their audience is and they're talking to them correctly, not only their audience, but their investors as well. Now, you've been working with a lot of the founders here right. with us. What types of things have you been doing in terms of helping founders? So it, it could be social media. It could be working with their messaging strategies, their content strategies, making sure that I talk through that with them, making sure that they're on the right track. Start small, wondering what they're actually up to. If they're working on getting investment money, making sure that they're actually talking to the investors the way that they should be and talking to their audiences the correct way, making sure that the audience that they're targeting is the right audience because sometimes they really don't know who their audience is. We work through all that. And what would you say is the number one piece of advice or like you said, mistake that founders make? Let's go with the early stage founder, a founder totally green, just launching their product. What are you seeing? That's easy. Um, so a lot of times founders know what they want, what their business is, what their product, what their service is, but they don't know how to talk about it. So what I do is try to help them talk about their product or service and explain to them, nobody gives a shit about them. And I don't mean that in a crass way, but what they're trying to do is explain who and what they are. And they have to do it in terms of making it very, very simplified. This is a six second society. And what they have to do is make it very easy for people to understand because generally people are lazy, ignorant, or busy, or a combination of all three. And in order to do that, whether it's communicating verbally or with a written word, People have to want to understand their business. Nobody cares. So they have to make them want to care. And there are ways to do it. And I start with those three topics, lazy, ignorant, and busy. And that's how you have to start. Not only that, but we're so bombarded constantly that we've learned to filter things out. And if Absolutely. you think to yourself, like you think about the, the founders out there in our community, you're starting an app. How many apps? We are blitzed with so many apps. They say that we only use some ridiculously low number, like 10% of the apps actually on our phone, plus all the apps available. And if you're bombarded, we've learned to filter out all that advertising, marketing, communication. And so founders have to cut through the noise. And not only that, like you said, try and motivate someone who's maybe stuck in a certain pattern or rhythm to disrupt them, get their attention. How are you seeing founders be successful right now? Like what are some things that you've worked with them on or that you're watching other founders do that have achieved that objective? Uh, so, so first thing is people need to be authentic. Other people want to connect with people. They do not want to connect with businesses. A lot of times businesses are so worried about making money. And yes, we need money to survive. Of course, we all need to pay our bills. I need to pay my bills too. Yes, my services, I charge. But at the same time, I'm willing to be vulnerable and I talk to people. And so what I tell founders is that you need to connect with people on an emotional level. People want to know other people and know that you're not perfect and it's okay to be not perfect. And it's really hard to understand how to get that vulnerability out there, that it's okay to make mistakes and you don't have to be perfect. So when you work on building those relationships and with that vulnerability, it makes a huge difference and other people will start to want to work with you and stalk you on social media and attract to you and then eventually want to come and find you and work with you with your product or your service. It makes a huge difference. Let me clarify this here then. When you say authentic and vulnerable, you're talking about the founder 
themselves versus just saying, we've got a great SaaS product, use it. You're advocating for an approach, which I would agree with if that's what you're doing in mm -hmm. terms of allowing the other users to get to know you as the founder. And that would be a way that you could start your initial customer acquisition. That's what you're saying. Absolutely. You don't need to sell your product. That's a hard sell. Go at it, soft sell, talk to people, get to know people, let them get to know you, the person, not the company. When you talk about yourself, you can also talk about your company too, but you're not selling your company. You're working through it and you're talking about your company, but then they feel like they know you and it's not sell, 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 call me. I'm awesome. They get to know that you're awesome and they feel like you're awesome. And then it's not a bunch of bullshit. I totally agree. When I went through my LinkedIn messages this morning, I did it exactly this morning and I went through the list and I previewed and you know how the preview, you can read the first line. And if mm -hmm. I see anything like either just selling, hey, are you interested in doing this? Or it's kind of just, I hope you're doing well, blah, blah, blah. And it doesn't get right to the point with something that's enticing or engaging that sparks that relationship. I automatically just hit red and I moved on. But the sure. ones that could capture my attention and initiate something novel, intriguing, dare I say, authentic, vulnerable, a relationship, I actually opened those and I responded to probably about 15 LinkedIn's. Now, I literally get dozens per day and it was stacking up, but I responded to about 15 this morning based on your exact criteria. That's yeah. what you're saying as well. Absolutely. I mean, think about it. When you're talking to people, just going through LinkedIn and you're trying to message them and you're pitch slapping, that's with the P, you're pitch slapping them. The first thing you say is buy this, do that. Let, let me put it to you in terms of regular everyday stuff. It's kind of like going on a first date. Are you going to ask somebody to marry you on the first date? No, you don't know that person. You haven't built a relationship with that person. You're not going to marry them on that first date. It's kind of like pitching somebody the first time you talk to them. You're not going to ask them to buy because they don't know you. You don't know them. Why would they buy from you? They don't know you. So don't ask them to buy anything. They don't know you. They're going to block you and never talk to you again. You've burned that bridge. So there you go. Don't on pitch. On top of which, if you use a cheesy pickup line like a pitch, uh, some people I would say like getting pitch slapped, if you will. But, you know, what you do in your spare time will leave up to you. But let's go through some questions. If you're yeah. listening to us, you're in the audience right now. We've prepared some special questions, but load them up. Use the Q&A box or start chattering away on chat. Jen's here. She's going to be watching the chat for us and then let us know. We're going to get to all the questions possible. But Q has gathered some questions that we think would be beneficial for you to explore for us to talk about together. Q, what do we got? Right. So our first one here, Ed, is given Gwen's experience, how much is she using AI in her work today? I love it. I'm so glad those came up. I'm glad this is the very first question. This makes me happy. All right. So people use AI to write all the time. And yes, I use AI, but I don't use it the way you think I use it. So I use it actually as a sounding board because I write by myself. I don't have anybody to, to go over things with. And my clients come to me for perfection. So when I'm going back and forth and I'm thinking and I'm going, oh, you know, I, I have writer's block. I don't know what to do. I will use AI and start asking questions. I'll, I'll put in everything that I've already written and I'll say, okay, I want this. I want this. I want this, but I'm missing something. AI might spit something out and that'll spark me to get going again. I might miss something. I might have something that is just not right. AI will spark me again. So then I'll be able to write some more and then I'll use it more as a sounding board as opposed to writing for me. And then I might go back through and say, okay, what about this? And so I'll go back through and just continue to use it as a sounding board. One thing that I have learned with AI is that you can actually prompt it to make your writing better, except you have to make sure that it's very authentic. So you can go back and forth, make sure that you're not using words like unlock and um, elevate. And there are certain words that AI just uses. Now I've used a gamut of AI tools, but there are words that you're like, that's AI. They didn't take the time to make it authentic. It doesn't sound like that person. So you constantly have to prompt it to make sure that it's you and it's yours because there is just so much that, that AI misses and it just doesn't sound like you. And it's 
it, it's awful and people know it. I can see it. I can see when a post is all AI. So just when you're using it, make sure that you're reading it and it really does sound like you. The problem is, is most people are using large language models. And if you think about how large language models were trained, it's based on the glut or the most common stuff that they're going to read on the internet. And that's the reason you get so many cliches and things like that. You're advocating for approach such as using AI as a co-pilot. Yeah. I love how ChatGPT will give me like the first really crappy draft and I'll feed it like the different beats that I want, the different points. And then I can say, ah, does it really work that way? Or how about try it this way? And it really starts to make time so much more efficient. That's the way that I approach AI. I think it's an equalizer. I want AI to do all the things I don't want to do. And I'll mm -hmm. stay doing the things that I'm strong at. That's the sort of approach that you're advocating for. But what I'm hearing, Gwen, is that we should be using AI. It's not like you're not saying, hey, don't use AI. AI is killing creativity or what have you. You're totally advocating for the tool. Hell yeah. I love it. Do you know how much time it saves me? I love it. Oh my gosh. It makes my job so much simpler. I can get through so much more writing with it. I love it. And it's not killing my job at all. I know how smart I am, but it makes me so much smarter. I love it. So use it. Just don't be stupid about it. Great. Well, you heard it right from the professional. Q, what's our next question? Thanks, Ed. Our next question here is, how do you balance the use of AI tools with the human touch to ensure content remains engaging and authentic? Constantly go back and forth with it. So if you're writing something and and let's say, we're, we're just gonna say chat GPT just to keep it simple. So we all know. So if you're using chat GPT and it spits something out and it doesn't sound like you, keep refining say words that you don't like in it, go back through, make it sound like you. So for me, I'm very no nonsense. I swear a lot. If you work with me, you know that. Ed has learned that a lot. And I'm trying really hard not to swear, Ed. I love you. So if I'm writing something, I'm very no nonsense. I know who, what my clients' tones, how their brands are. I make sure that everything is specific to their brands. So I'm constantly rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. And so when I'm prompting things, no, this isn't the right word, or this is not the right word. I, I like this phrase better. Let's incorporate this, or just constantly going back until it sounds exactly how I would want it to sound. So it, it's all about the prompts. And it's just like soundboarding, going back and forth, and making sure that you're saying, I like these words, or I like this word, or can we incorporate something like this? And it might not be perfect. It might not be exactly what you want, but telling it how you sound and how you feel, it will incorporate those words. You could actually try train your AI, ChatGPT mm -hmm. is getting really good at it where you can upload what you previously written or upload a transcript on how you talk and it will do a generally good job. What I like to do is throw in like personal stories because ChatGPT can't read your mind. So if you're writing something and a point comes up, you can say, and in my experience, da, 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 and go from there. So you start personalizing and start adding all these touches. I love what you're saying. What are some other ways that you think like, for example, like Gwen, do you ever think that maybe when we're using a AI, we should try and mimic somebody else's style? Like I've tried this before, like write an article about this using these points and the, the points that I want, but write it like a best-selling author or write it like someone from Harvard yeah. Business Review or Simon Sinek, because I'm a big fan. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. If you emulate somebody else, absolutely. But then also make sure to put your spin on it so that it's authentic to you. Don't forget about your authenticity because if it's coming from you, it should be coming from you. But you can put other people's spin on it. I mean, feel free to do that. Absolutely. But make sure that you're authentic to yourself too. Don't forget about yourself. You are the most important person. This begs the question then. Let's go back for just a moment because you keep using the word authentic to yourself. How do founders actually figure that out? How do I know if I'm being authentic to myself? That's a good question. So I always ask the question, this is one of the very first questions I ask founders. Why did you start your business? What made you start your business? What was the problem? What was the pain? What was the emotion that made you start this business? Because the majority of founders did not start this business for money because starting a business is not easy. It's not about money. It may be in the future, but it's not gonna start out in money. There is a reason. What is that reason? So that's where it all starts from. And the more that you start talking about it, the more that you vocalize it, 
you learn the why. And that's where the authenticity comes from. Because usually there's personal stories, there's professional stories, there's all kinds of things that intertwine to it. Yes, there might be an exit strategy eventually, but in the very beginning, there's always a bunch of emotional stuff. And that's where the authenticity comes from. You're talking about doing a certain degree of self-exploration, having self-awareness, that's the secret. If you're going to want to be authentic with others, you got to be authentic yourself or you have to know who you are so you can manage that. Absolutely. So important because if you don't know yourself, how are others going to get to know you? Why would people invest in you, both investors and the audience and people want to buy your product or service? Why would they invest anything in you if you aren't willing to invest in yourself? That's a great, good point. If you're not willing to invest in yourself. I'm pretty sure for those founders who are going to be watching this and they're looking to raise investment, I think an investor, and I can speak from that side of the table, an investor will know if you spent the time and you're being true to yourself. A lot of times investors will actually give you what I affectionately refer to as the shit test. Happens a lot in dating, but the investor will start to push and prod you and see if he can knock you off your convictions. How much of a spine do you have versus are you just saying, okay, whatever you say, I just want your money. That's a major flag. So I think it goes both ways. If you're raising money or you're trying to sell the product, authenticity, vulnerability, that sounds good. Hugh, what else do we have? I know you got more questions. I do, Ed. So the next question here is, in your work, you've demonstrated a unique ability to turn complex ideas into clear, compelling stories. What strategies do you recommend for startups looking to simplify their message while still making a powerful impact? Thank you. I appreciate that. I take great pride in it. Um, so when I'm talking to startups, uh, when you're trying to explain something, people understand themselves very well. And sometimes it's very, very difficult for them to explain it to others. So when I'm talking about storytelling or explaining anything, always what I do is start with a problem. There is a problem that has to be solved. And that's what their, their business is all about is solving some problem. But the problem isn't enough. There is a pain that the problem goes to. It's the pain that needs to be addressed because the pain is the emotional portion. That is what is really important. The problem is a big deal. The problem causes that pain, but it's the emotional being that is what's really going to connect with people, that's going to connect with the investors, that's going to connect with the audience. So everybody will feel that pain, whether it's some sort of negative pain, it's it's the frustration, it's the anger, it's not being able to make money. I mean, think about it. We didn't realize with smartphones what our pains were. So we were carrying around musical devices, cameras, phones, all this stuff. We had no idea we had these problems and these pains. We're lugging around all these things. We didn't know what we didn't know. We didn't know that we could have this all-in-one device all at the same time until it was introduced to us. And then all of a sudden there was a solution presented to us. But the way that it was presented to us was why carry around all of these things? You don't have to lug all this stuff. We were presented with the pain of lugging all this stuff around. It wasn't even the problem. It was the pain of lugging it. And then he presented the solution. That's how we need to present things. How does it affect us negatively in our lives? If that's something that we can do on a regular basis, then people are going to be like, oh, I have that problem too. I see what you're talking about. You've got us on an emotional level. We experience it. We feel it. We're like, oh, I connect with you. I see it. That's how you tell the stories. That's how you explain complex ideas. And that's when people are going to say, I get it. So you don't have to tell all this stuff. You don't have to explain everything about your solution, all the complexities to it. You just have to explain how those, how it's going to affect those people in a positive way. That's all you have to do, but that's not easy. Let's take this into the realm of communicating with investors, because I know this comes up, up a lot for founders. What they sure. do is they are in their heads. And first, this is where it's gonna be a little different. I got some questions to follow up with this. Founders speak with customers when they're trying to pitch to investors. So they're saying, yeah you can do this and my service is amazing. And they, they pitch the customer, but instead they should be pitching the investor in their pitch deck. Yep. The second, it's walls of text. It's so complex. All these technical terms where you need inside information because the founder really wants to impress the investor. So all this complexity, 
because of technical expertise inside language starts to seep in. How then with customers, you said, I'm going to solve a problem for you and I empathize with your pain. That's how I heard it. Here's the pain mm -hmm. that I understand. But how do you break it down and get out of your head and turn it into simple language that the customer will actually understand versus in your own head, it sounds really great. And I understand it because I'm living in this problem. How do you cross that gap of complexity? Boil it down in some real tactical terms on how you simplify your message. All right. So there were a lot of things that you asked in there. So, so let's address them. First of all, Let's talk to fourth graders. Let's talk to our kids. Let's make our kids understand what the hell it is we do every day. When our kids can understand it, then that's that's when other people will understand it. It goes back to the lazy, ignorant, and busy. People are ignorant in what we do. And I don't know what it is that you do every day, nor do I give a shit. No offense. I love you. I know you do a lot. I appreciate you. I don't know what the hell you do. I don't give a shit. Just keep doing what you're doing. So that goes to the fact Founders, they're very technical. They don't understand when they're talking to different audiences. Investors are very, very different than audiences. Investors care about money. Are they going to invest in you? Are they? Are you going to make money? Are they going to make money? Are they going to make their money back? Are then they going to make money later? Essentially, that's what, what they care about. I mean, there's a few other things, but that's essentially what they care about. So when you're talking to investors, you need to explain to them, not all this mumbo jumbo, they don't care about that. They need to make sure that you understand your audience, that you can talk to them like fourth graders, that you know them, that you can sell to them, that you've got a cool idea, that it's going to work, and that you're going to make money. How do you do that? I got this cool idea. This is why it's important. And this is why it's going to sell. This is how you're going to make money. Again, talk to fourth graders. Would a fourth grader give up his lollipop that he loves so much to give it and give it to you for whatever widget you're selling? Think about it in those terms, you know, like your children, do they get it? Once your children get it, other people are going to get it. It doesn't have to be rocket science. And believe me, I've worked with NASA. I've worked with some of the most brilliant minds. And believe me, they're freaking difficult to understand. And I have almost slapped them because they don't get it either. And once I explain it to them, they'll start to understand. They've been able to talk to their kids and they talk and they're like, none of my kids actually get it because you dumb it down. It's it. Think about it when you're going to the bathroom, you scroll through. What, what what do you like to read? You like to read stupid stuff when you're pooping. You know, think about it. Everybody likes to read stupid stuff when they're pooping. So do investors. Think about it. It's just that simple. I never thought about the whole concept of the lollipop. Okay, so I've heard, talk to the fourth grader, dumb it down. I always say this, boil it down to the dumbest rich person in the room, not to say that they're stupid or anything like that, but you're just making sure you're not creating any friction. But is your message compelling enough to have them give up their lollipop? That is a fascinating thing because if I remember fourth grade or my kids in fourth grade, they ain't giving up that lollipop so easily. So mm -hmm. if you can create a compelling enough message or say, I've got something better for you than that lollipop, that is a pretty good technique, Gwen. That's what I'm thinking. You know? It's the little things. Fantastic. All right. Let's check in on our audience. We had some questions come through. Jen, what do we got so far? Well, I think you actually slightly answered this one, but if there's any additional comments, we had Hess leave a message. If investors want to invest in the founder, should the first page of the deck be the about me? Um, I, let me jump into this one yeah. right away. Yeah. And we can talk a bit about how to communicate properly, but it is generally a bad idea to make the first slide in your deck about me. And that is because normally it doesn't move the needle. If you empathize with an investor's perspective, they are looking for, does your problem make sense? Is it big enough for me to be interested? And do I care about this problem first? Second, does your solution make sense? And do I believe the solution solves the problem in a unique and novel way. That's super important. Unless you have won a Nobel Prize or you're like a massive celebrity, you're Tom Brady, or you were a previous founder and you took a company public and you are bouncing into the next venture, there's nothing really that you're gonna say that moves the needle enough for an investor to think, okay, I don't need to know about the problem and the solution. Sometimes, yes you might have enough domain expertise, enough accolades where they go, holy crap, this is the next person to start up. For example, Adam Newman, who did WeWork, and he bombed 
like massive investment, lost hundreds of millions of dollars, got to a billion dollar valuation, it completely tanked. But he had enough reputation that if you said on the first slide, this is Adam Newman's next venture, I'd be interested. But if you're just saying, oh, this is about me, I grew up in a small town, I'm super smart, I love this and I love that, and I'm raising two kids and I have a programming degree, that's just not enough. Your opinions, Gwen, how much have you experienced this? Remember when I said people don't give a shit about you? <laughs> That is Sorry. so succinct. Thank you very much, Glenn. You're not doing very good in terms of the not swearing during this uh, podcast, but that's all right. It brings color and flavor. I love it. I'm not complaining whatsoever. Sorry. Jen, any other questions we got? Yes, we have another question that came in from Tony. He said, do you feel it's more impactful when starting out to focus on posting my own content versus commenting on other people's posts? Oh, that's a good one. I think it's got to be 50-50. So um, I think you do have to post your own content um, because once you start posting on other people's content, they're going to want to see what you have to say too. So it's got to be like a 50-50. Um, and I do think you need to post on other people's content. You definitely need to comment on it. And you want to comment on the people that you care about, uh, because those are the people that you're going to be able to build in your own network. And you want to build the network towards your audience, towards the people that you really have an affinity towards, people that, that mean something to you, either in your own field or the people that you want to build a network with in, in any way, shape or form. So yeah, it's, it, it really does have to be 50-50. Is that on LinkedIn or does this work better commenting on other people's stuff better on certain platforms? So it, it really depends on where your audience is. So you need to be where your audience is. So yes, definitely on LinkedIn, but you need to be, if your audience isn't on LinkedIn, don't go to LinkedIn. Um, it, it really depends. So I always talk to my clients and ask them if they know where their audience is. And some people do and some people don't. So we need to research to find out where they are. One of my clients was like, my 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 audience is all Gen X or not Gen X, I'm sorry, Gen Z. So we looked at TikTok, but then we were trying to figure out where else we should go. And we we were looking and, and he really wanted to go on X. I was like, okay, spend your time. Okay. But you know, that was his decision. Have fun. But um, it, it just, it just depends on where your audience is. But yeah, I can agree. I think that if you can comment on a post, and I like to do this, sometimes I'll see a post that gets under my skin. And I know my audience is reading that and I will post something contrarian to mm -hmm. the post or I'll post helpful information to augment that post. And not only do I get the attention of the individual that was posting, but I also see other people read my comments. And LinkedIn is really great because you can see who likes your comment mm -hmm. and you can follow that person. And I find that LinkedIn is just better for it rather than commenting on Instagram or something. Facebook, I think, works really well if you've got the right audience there. But I would agree. I've seen some good results. Unfortunately, I don't do it enough. You're saying literally 50-50. Post your own stuff and post on other people's comments. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely 50-50. Because a lot of times when you're posting comments on other people's, you can get viral comments. And it's amazing what can happen because the networks can spread. And I have seen, I have actually, because I've gotten viral comments on other people, I've gotten 50 followers based on one comment. And I'm not trying to, I, I actually keep my followers very small. I, I, I don't want a huge network on followers intentionally um, because I like to interact with people. And, um, but based on one comment, they were like, oh my gosh. And so I would talk with all these people because I, that's what I like to do. And it, it just, it, it's amazing what can actually happen. How possible is it then to pull a ninja maneuver and hijack somebody else's audience? How much have you done that or seen that before? I have seen it before. And um, in fact, one of my clients is complaining about it because one of her people, and she's got a huge following. She's got, I don't know, 15, 20,000 followers. And somebody that both she and I know is trying to hijack her followers. So it happens. Let's stay on the topic of LinkedIn just for a second. Yeah. We do these LinkedIn posting parties here at startups.com. It is something that we started really at the behest. It was sparked by you and another one of our advisors. Hopefully we'll get them on the show, JD Miller. And how it works is we all post our LinkedIn content together and at the same time. And then there's this two hour window where we 
like each other's posts, comment on each other's posts, and then comment on the comments. And we mm -hmm. trade back and forth and we sort of throttle the algorithm. And then I've seen triple my impressions, like literally 3x my traffic based on doing this because it's just the way that LinkedIn works. Yeah. What would you say to the founder out there on why they should attend a LinkedIn posting party and just encourage everybody to get involved? I think there's a lot of benefit to it, especially with founders who are very unfamiliar with LinkedIn. They want to learn about it. They want to understand how it works and they're trying to build their network. I think this is a fantastic way to one, learn how to post, build their networks, and then really increase how their content marketing uh, just their posting abilities, because a lot of times um, I've seen somebody who is absolutely brand new to LinkedIn and their post posting quality right now, their content is so good. She and I have talked a lot now and just her quality is really good. And she's actually gotten investors on her posts like, just because her quality is so good. And it, it's just amazing. It's, it's a long game, but there are other ways, in fact, to to increase the people who come on to it, but you have to have good quality content. You have to have people going on and liking and commenting. And this is a good way to get going, to get started, to increase so much of your following, so much of your connection, so much of your content. And this is a great way to get things going and get things started. And then you're going to be able to grow and to understand and it's been fantastic. And for you to get three times is phenomenal. And we haven't been doing it all that long, maybe what, six, seven, eight months, maybe? I think so. Yeah. It's not that long for that to happen. So, you know, founders can get a significant reward out of it. Here's the most common question that comes up yeah. is what type of content should I be posting? And if you look at the array, some people like to post their lunch. This is what I ate. Funny cat video, funny quote, Don't do that. <laughs> a little anecdote. Or some people like to share an article from the web. They put a link and they make that the content. Or some people try and share their company pages. Like you see this array. I like to write long form articles because I find that if someone's willing to read my entire article, they become more suited. They're, they're the best suited, my ideal customer profile. So if you're advising one of our founders, new saying, I'm going to attend a LinkedIn posting party. What type of content should I prepare? What would you say to them? So I think in the beginning, start shorter just to get a feel for it. You want to start. That is the very first thing is just to start because a lot of times people are extremely uncomfortable and they don't know what to post. There are so many different ways and different types of posts Starting is the big thing. Once you get more and more comfortable, you can try different types of posts. You can do long form, you can do short form, you can do videos, you can do carousels. There are so many different types of posts. And sometimes you just need to try to see what works and resonates with your audience. Just try and you will eventually start to see what works well with your audience, but you have to keep doing it and you have to keep posting and you, what works well. One thing I have to say, authenticity. I cannot stress that enough. I say it all the time, authenticity. Be who you are always because people are gonna know when you're fake. So the more real you are, the more you talk about whatever. I mean, you don't talk about your lunch, okay? Just, just don't, <laughs> nobody, gives no, nobody cares about your lunch. Talk about something real. You can talk about your life. You can talk about your business. You can talk about all kinds of things. Talk about thought leadership. You can talk about all kinds of things. It does not have to be perfect. It will get better over time. And even when you come to the LinkedIn posting parties, you'll see all the different types and you'll get better with it. You'll learn so much. Our goal is to teach you and you'll see the different types and it doesn't have to be difficult. You just keep going. The more and more you do it, you'll get better but just start, just start. Don't be afraid, just start. Even if you say, hi, I'm Gwen, cool. Hi, good to meet you, that's all, just start. You're reminding me of all the exercise advice out there and I'm trying to get back into shape and I remember times where I would try and research all the different types of workouts and the science behind it. And then a trainer told me at the best exercise is the one that you're gonna do. And exactly. <laughs> just get out there and then you'll start to know which one works better for you and you'll start to see the results and you get a feel for it and that's what you just keep building on and i really appreciate that gwen i think one of the big benefits of our linkedin posing party 
is that it requires the founder, everybody out there to actually attend on a regular yeah. basis. And people show up just for accountability and they say, I got to get my one weekly LinkedIn post out there. I think it's so helpful. Yeah. I absolutely agree. I mean, sometimes it helps me to do it because I write for so many other people. It helps me just to get mine out. Let's talk about that and then we'll get to a fun little article. You just right. triggered a question for me. You said it helps, but you're writing for so many other people. So let's talk about the founder that says, I want to hire someone like you. Let's take you out of the equation. I want to hire someone to help me with my marketing. Is that a good idea? How should they go about it? What advice? Like, imagine your friend's mom came to you and said, Gwen, I need some advice. And you were off the table. What would you say in terms of hiring someone for marketing help? So where they are, what they're capable of doing themselves. I want to teach people so they can do a few things themselves. Because sometimes people aren't ready to hire other people. If they're able to, fantastic. But some companies, one, don't have the resources. And two, they need to learn a little bit because I will tell you, as most people know, there are a lot of marketing you salesmen out there and they will sell you everything in the kitchen sink. I don't like founders to get used and abused and a lot of people do that. So it's about learning as much as you can, doing as much as you can. And then when you get to the point when you can hire somebody, you want to hire the right person. There are people like me and other companies that are fantastic for founders, but you want to focus on somebody who knows how to work with founders. You don't want to hire a big agency because they don't care. They are focused on large corporations. A lot of times they want your money and they're just going to go and go and go and promise you the world and give you nothing. So focus on somebody who knows about founders and entrepreneurship and all the series for funding. That's really important because if they don't understand that, they don't understand you. They don't know what you need. That's really important. You make such an important point. And this goes for developers as well. If you're hiring a big agency and they got this big overhead, you want to think about it in terms of how much extra overhead do they have that you're going to be paying for and are you willing to pay for it? And unless you're a massive brand and you've got budgets like Coca-Cola and you're having to protect huge market share, you don't have the money. You're most likely bootstrapping or you're just squeezing every single penny out of your pre-seed funding. That's the reason you want to work with someone like Gwen because – Gwen, I, I've seen you work with founders. You help them figure it out. And then you say, hey, now we can invest in it more, but let me at least help you establish a foundation. And many times, and this is just a shout out for you, you've come back to me and you said, this person is just not ready, or I want to help this person kind of get on their feet on their own before they have to spend money. I think it's a great approach. And it's just another big benefit that you bring to the community. We really Thank appreciate you. you, Gwen. This is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. One thing, um, I, I do want to say about that is you will see with companies who do have overhead, something that um, a lot of people don't realize is that companies will charge other companies to prepare presentations for new companies. So when you see, I don't know, an agency who gives you a beautiful presentation, it's all pretty, it's all fancy, a nice proposal, it's all gorgeous. They've charged that time for your proposal to another company. So that might take 25 hours. They've charged it to somebody else. They're going to do that to you. Be aware of that stuff. It's little things like that. That's kind of sneaky, Gwen. That's kind of sneaky. I never thought about that before. And I used, to, I used to work with agencies all the time. Hmm. Okay, Q, we've got some fun articles. What have you got prepared for us? This is where we get to do a little bit of a hot take. What do you got, Q? So today our article is titled, Emotion AI could be the next trend for business software and that could be problematic. Uh, today's article basically discusses the growing trend of Emotion AI and it's a technology designed to improve AI's ability to understand human emotions through various inputs like visual and audio sensors. The goal is to make AI interactions more human-like, particularly in customer service and other business applications. However, there are clearly concerns about its accuracy and potential regulatory challenges. What do you guys think? Well, shit. <laughs> Emotion AI. This is an interesting sort of thing. Gwen, you got any hot takes on this? Because I'm still processing all the advances in AI right now. I mean, AI is going to continue to advance. AI, is it's cool. It's super cool. And um, wow. I'm just kind of blown away by this right now. <laughs> um, I, I'm not surprised that this is happening. Let me share a story that relates kind of to this. So one of my colleagues a few years ago took a phone call and the guy who she was talking to didn't believe it was her. 
didn't believe it was a real human because she he thought it was AI. And this call went on for almost 45 minutes, I think. And she said, I don't know what to tell you. I live in Pittsburgh. I, I forget where he was from. Um, I live in Pittsburgh. I'm a Steelers fan. I have two children. And he, it, she didn't know how to get him to believe that she was a human. He thought she was a robot. And she was giving real emotion. And he was like, I don't believe you. I, I think you're a robot. So it goes into the emotional AI aspect of it. How are we going to decipher who's human and who's robot? If this is already starting to happen, you know, people don't believe it. So I don't know. I mean, we already have chatbots and we can kind of tell, but, and, and I'm always constantly saying we need to be authentic. So this means even more, we need to really know who we are and talk about who we are. So people know that we're talking to a real person because AI is just going to get better and better. So uh, I don't know how I feel about this, quite frankly. Let's explore this from two facets. And this is where I agree with you. Things are getting scary. One, deep faking is a massive problem right now. Like they're passing yeah. laws. I saw a story out of Korea, like these K-pop girls are more deep fake than anybody else. And it has a lot to do with the cultural nuances of what's going on over there, being Korean myself and a sort of K-pop fan. But so you got deep faking, there's an issue. And then next, it doesn't take much to kind of draw people into the AI world. And you see this proliferation of the AI girlfriends and you see like young men saying, I'm not gonna be in a relationship with a physical biological member. Like just, I'm not gonna be in a relationship because I've got an anime girlfriend, yeah. virtual girlfriend. Now, if you start adding emotions to that little girl avatar, that to me is scary, first of all, okay? But here's where the article was really interesting for me. It talked about how does a chatbot know the difference between what are you talking about, I'm angry, and what are you talking about, I'm confused. And they're the two same sentences. And I think that's a very interesting, problem that AI is trying to solve. And I'm going to say, I'll see it when I believe it, because literally when you're texting, you'd have to take into so much voice inflection, all the previous conversation. Can you get that through the typing? Or maybe there's more prompts. I'm not too sure. Hugh, you did some research on this. What's the prevailing thought? What's What are people saying? Or generally, what do you think about this story? I think generally the consensus among people and, and including the person who wrote the article, is they're generally pretty leery. What does this mean for the future if something like this is implemented, right? And then also, just to your point, Ed, the difference between different emotions. You can say one statement, but it could mean you could mean it in two different ways. You could be either confused or angry with one particular statement. So that was actually an example presented. I also did some additional research and just being that Emotion AI was implemented for specific business needs and customer service needs. My question was how satisfied are people with customer service? Now in the UK, according to research from Cavill, almost half of consumers, 44%, believe that customer service has gotten worse over the past three years. And that was April 19th, 2024. And then there was a North American study and the, the difference sig was pretty significant. And it was about 77% of people are happy with their experiences with customer service. So a bit of a cultural difference there. But I think going forward, you know, I myself have my reservations about this but i also think unpopular opinion this could be beneficial for us and the reason i think that is because with the use of social media the increase in technology we're a pretty lonely society people are more lonely than ever on an emotional social basis and this could be a solution for that not without a cost q jen gwen i got a question for you have you ever you don't have to give me gory details have you ever talked to an ai like a person because you're either lonely you wanted personal advice there wasn't somebody around how many times have you done that i've only done it with sounding board when i write okay so you haven't gone into that personal companionship q yeah. what about you i mean i think my answer gave it away a little bit <laughs> I, 
<laughs> but definitely, I think sometimes in this day and age and for different people, depending on who you are and how you operate, I think the difficulty can be knowing who to trust and with what information, right? And especially with personal details or relationship details or just wanting guidance, so to speak. So I think with AI, the benefit to asking AI personal questions or emotional based, based advice is you can also prompt it to give you therapy advice or psychologically informed advice and actually get advice that you're looking for versus, you know, if you're talking to a friend, sometimes they don't always say the right thing or something that's going to be helpful. So I definitely have used AI for those purposes and I found it quite helpful. Jen, spill the tea. I would have to say I'm more on the side with Gwen. I haven't used it personally in that sense. But with that being said, to kind of go down the road where Q is saying that if you have a situation, bumping things off of it as a sounding board of, okay, this is what's happening. Give me some options here. But I wouldn't say I'd go for it for anything more than just the sounding board if I'm not getting a quick response from family or friends. I'm going to leave you the last word, but I'm going to spark or plant a seed for everybody watching out there. It's only a matter of time before you can use AI to allow content to be customized. So if someone's reading it in a certain demographic, that article, that piece of content will literally change to fit that person. Mm -hmm. I think that's a massive use case they're figuring out right now, but time will tell. That's another topic for another discussion. Gwen, I appreciate you so much, all your lively advice, your commentary. You've been so generous with our community. Give us the last word. How can people connect with you? How would you like them to connect with you? Give a little plug for who you are and, and what you do at startups.com. Oh, thank bad. So I am on LinkedIn um, slash Gwen Mislinski, M-Y-S-L-I-N-S-K-I. You can also find me on the web at convergencemktg.com. You can DM me on LinkedIn. That's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me um, with startups.com. I ha do have office hours for 15 minute slots. And uh, I, I'm here to advise with social media, messaging, content. I, I like to help people. So I, I want to make sure that you are on the go and on the go correctly. I, I don't want to waste your time. I don't want you to waste mine. So it's it's meant to be a symbiotic relationship. So if you need me, I'm here. So let me know how I can help you. Not a week goes by that I hear a founder that I don't hear a founder say, I'm working with Gwen. So this is a common sort of thing that occurs. So we really appreciate Gwen. You're so generous. We are going to leave all of Gwen's content information, all the links in the description below. Make sure you check that out. That's our episode of startups.com live today. We are here every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at the same time. Make sure you check us out. Thanks everyone for joining us. Have a great day.